Hello everyone, my name is Chao Tayana Maina. I'm a Kenyan Digital Heritage Specialist and a Digital Humanities Scholar. Today, I'll be speaking about the future of history and the need to strengthen public histories through digital interventions. I'll be speaking both to my own experience as a digital historian, as a public historian, but also referencing the work and material that is um, being made by so many fascinating people around African heritage online. Now, before we begin um, looking at public history and uh, digital interventions, the first thing would be, the first thing I'd like to talk about is the foundation and legacy, because this sets a backdrop for why these interventions are important, who they're important for. Uh, now, Emmanuel Arinze, who was the former chairman of the West African Museums uh, program, in his paper, African Museums and the Challenge of Change, wrote that African museums are not established for the same reasons as Western museums which encouraged scholarship and provided educational enjoyment for their public and was seen as agents of change for national growth and development. In contrast, African museums are created to house the curious of a tribal people and to satisfy the curiosity of the elite citizenry, citizenry almost to the total exclusion of the local people who produce the objects. Now, when we look at these foundations, particularly uh, on African museums and this talk which focuses on the interventions of public history within communities whose history has been misrepresented, suppressed, and erased through digital tools, it is very important to look at legacy and how this foundation and this question of legacy plays into the way we relate with um, culture and heritage today, but particularly how we consume it, how we share it, how we disseminate it, and how we participate within it. So what does this mean for communities and audiences? I think for many communities whose history, as I said, has been misrepresented and suppressed, Digital tools have provided a way to engage outside the dominant paradigms and canons that have been set around how our history should be consumed, what our history is, and how we can engage within it at a very personal and practical level. So we, we are seeing digital spaces and platforms have having this immense impact and providing some kind of outlet for minority groups and minority communities to talk about their frustrations with how their history is told, but also the narrative that they know from their own personal experience through community history, through community participation, and through oral histories. In defense of public history, and uh, this is where I'd like to speak particularly on the importance of public history and the need to, to look at um, public participation as a very, very key part in, in the historical understanding and in the process of historical inquiry. So when we look at public history, we generally deviate from a focus on history being something that is um, the preserve of either academics or specialists. And we're looking at the way in which members of the public, practically anyone who has an interest within this subject can use historical methods, um, either through training or through apprenticeship or just through personal practice um, to immerse themselves in this process of historical inquiry and finding and, and, and documentation. And now the aim of public history is to deepen and, and empower the public's connection with the knowledge of the past. Within the space of public history, some of the questions that emerge are what tools do we need to strengthen and encourage this um, culture of public participation? And how do we measure or even support public historians in their work? Now, I myself uh, began working in history as, as a public historian, as an amateur, as someone who was not exactly coming from the field. I had a training in computer science and furthermore studying history, especially within the climate of the Kenyan education system was not something that successful quote unquote people did. So for me, finding my way in history and, and really grounding myself in this practice of becoming a historian, but also identifying methods that work for me within my context has been very key. And where does digital fit in? So I'll be speaking both remember two parts of public history and, and digital interventions. So in a sector that we're looking, um, in a sector such, such as this that has been historically founded on exclusion, bias, and disregard for indigenous knowledge, we ask ourselves today, what is it that we can use, particularly around digital media and digital technology, to dismantle these structures that have made it very difficult for us to engage with history at a personal level, but also a history that humanizes us and um, sees us as people, not objects, not cabinets of curiosities particularly. And when we speak about democratization in essence, 
how how are digital spaces um, being democratized? But also, I think a very critical question for us as practitioners are how are digital spaces also manifesting and entrenching the same structures of exclusion, inequality, and privilege that we find in the physical world or in the real world, quote unquote. So public history and digital. For me, this is a very key part of what I do, uh, not only what I do, but also how I see things shaping up in terms of what it looks like to, to be a historian you know, today and tomorrow. Uh, in speaking to the role of, of digital interventions within public history, I'll be looking at four, five key sections, particularly sharing dissemination uh, of historical material. I'll also be looking at public participation. And in this front, looking at history as an active process, history as a verb, history as something we do and history as something we, we live. Um, I'll be looking at the place of digital media in the reclamation of narratives and the shifting of lenses. I'll be looking at the impact that this work has. And finally, exploring some challenges and opportunities that are presented by this intersection of public history and digital media. The first project that I will talk about is a project that is very close to my heart, but also one that um, I think really speaks to, to this intersection of public history and digital technology. And this is a project called the Museum of British Colonialism. Now, MBC, I keep saying in all of my discussions, is a very big name for a small group of volunteers who are working in Kenya and the UK to document, realize, disseminate, and share more truthful, more inclusive, um, more holistic accounts of British colonialism. And the inspiration for this project was which was founded by a group of, of Kenyan women and, uh, and, and, and women from the UK, myself included, was the fact that we were coming from different ends of the spectrum, but we both understand, understood very little about the colonial experience. And I'm not just talking about facts and dates, and this was the year Kenya got independence, and this was the year that Kenya was colonized. No, I'm talking about the experience of colonialism the lived experience and the actual, um, the human experience of it. So MBC in essence started as a counter to the lack, particularly the lack of this, of, of, of a central place or even a place to talk about these histories. And just to set the context for in which we are working in, um, I mentioned that we are a group of volunteers working across two continents with very limited resources and mostly using online um, platforms and media as our primary form of dissemination. But to speak to the context of the work that we're doing, specifically here in Kenya, I'll give you a bit of background context on the historical, historical lens through which we are, we are working in. Um, now, the history of colonialism in Kenya is, is very, it's one that I like to call invisibly visible. Because while it is known that Kenya was colonized, there's a lot about the colonial experience that is simply not heard, simply not understood, and simply not recognized. The first thing um, I'd, I'd speak to is the erasure and suppression of this history. So when Kenya was getting independence, and, and this is a, a campaign that was happening generally in, in different countries that were colonized by the British, the British government migrated and destroyed archives on, on independence for different colonies. In Kenya, particularly um, documents on the state of emergency and the presence of detention camps were either migrated to the UK or destroyed, which means that I, as a Kenyan, um, someone who was born here, someone who has lived here, would either have to go to the UK to access these archives or simply not even have access to them at all. Um, we also have structures of detention and, and um, structures that were set up to detain people in, in so sort of like concentration camps are destroyed and repurposed after independence. And the Mau Mau movement, which is the movement for independence and land rec reclamation is criminalized, criminalized in Kenya until 2003. This means that it's very hard to form association. It's very hard to have you know, community awareness about what happened due to this criminalization, which was instituted by the British, but the Kenya government kept this um, terrorist, terrorist status uh, until 2003. So you can imagine what kind of environment it created. So we're looking at digital media, we're looking at public history, but we're also looking at the context in which these tools and this, um, these approaches 
fit into the, the, the broader historical lens. So the first project that we've been doing as MBC is mapping and visualizing detention camps in colonial Kenya. I had mentioned earlier that um, in October 1952, the colonial administration in Kenya declared a state of emergency in the name of retaining control over the country because of the Mau Mau uprising, which was in favor of independence and land reclamation in the country. Through this um, state of emergency, we have uh, the British state constructing a large scale system of detention camps across the country. We're speaking of more than 100 camps in forced villages in which uh, nearly 160,000 people are detained in the course of eight to nine years. At its peak, the detention camp system in Kenya held nearly 70,000 people. So we are speaking about you know, multiple centers across Kenya, multiple um, tens of thousands of people being detained. But what happens after, imagine, after independence sorry, is that the knowledge, particularly the history of these camps becomes virtually erased. And speaking both, again, I'll return to the, to the point of erasure and suppression and how this creates a climate in which the particular history of these camps is just not known. So this project that we're doing with MBC is a very deliberate approach, but also a very intentional way of learning and finding out about our own history. And I'll speak um, now to the methods in which we are, we are applying to map and, and visualize and create awareness on the presence of detention camps in colonial Kenya. So the first step that we, we did was to try and visualize exactly what was the scale of detention. So on the right, you have this table on Wikipedia, which just lists different towns. And on the left, you have a map of Kenya and uh, visualization. Each of the points you see on the map is a detention camp. And what was so fascinating about visualizing it in this way was that I think we never quite grasped the scale of detention until you put it on a map and you see how sprawled out they are, but also how far reaching the system of detention was, it was very interesting to see both us ourselves as, as people who are working to, to understand this period, but also how to see the audiences, particularly Kenyan audiences were shocked to, and, and, and I'd say Kenyan audiences of a younger generation who didn't live through this period were shocked to see just how many camps they were, but also shocked to realize that this was not a history that we spoke about openly as a country. Now, a process of documenting, I spoke about documenting, and in this, in, this, in this section, I'll speak to history being an active process for us, a thing we do, you know, a verb. And this process of documentation for us involves going to different parts of the country, seeing whether there are any structures of detention that are still there, and if they are documenting what we find either through video and, and photography and then sharing this material online. So what we've been trying to be very deliberate about is to have this um, section where we're calling Mau Mau Field Diaries. And in this field diaries, you can see us walking through the camps in this pretty much the same manner. This is the first time we're accessing these spaces. Now, after independence, some of these camps were either turned into schools and prisons. And for us, that was a key place to start. We visited two former camps that are now secondary schools in central Kenya. And we were able to find structures that were there from the period of, of, of detention. Obviously, the buildings have been modified and the, the, the sites themselves being used as schools have grown to have more buildings and more more administrative centers. However, you will still find remnants of the former camp structures. And this was very interesting for us both to document, but also to, to realize that this is still very much a part of, of, of the country's uh, psyche, but very much embedded also in the country's landscape. So to visualize these centers, um, visualize and by visualize, I'm saying digitally visualize these centers, we're using multiple sources. We're using archives. We're using physical evidence that you find in the camps today. We're using oral histories, academic literature books, and so on. And for us, it's been very uh, interesting and very intentional to, to sort of expand the sources that we're using as opposed to using what's already there, which would be, in essence, repeating the same um, canonization of, of, of established knowledge and established paradigms 
going out of our way to deliberately seek for alternative narratives, perspectives that have been silenced and suppressed. And this allows us to have a very holistic view and, and to create visualizations and digital material that encompasses much more than simply archives or books, ETC. So here you will see a visualization, a 3D visualization that is based on archives, um, an archival source rather, and this is a video that we found on the British Pate. And you can see um, detainees leaving a detention camp in central Kenya. Here you can see the gate. You can also see the watchtower. And on the right, you can see a, a digital interpretation of the same site. Now, this site is not there today, uh, specifically the watchtower that you can see here and the gate. So even if you went to this, this, this location today, you wouldn't find the structures. So a key part of visualizing this camp has been trying to understand what's there and what's changed. The buildings you see in the background are still there and still part of the school. However, the gate and the watchtower are not. And in essence, really trying to combine this very forensic, I would say, approach to investigating and, and trying to interpret um, history based on the sources that are available. The next visualization is also based on an archival source, and this is a photograph from the book Mau Mau Detainee. And we attempted again to create a digital render of these, of these sites. Now the digital render that you create, we create are 3D renders and you can interact with them in, in three dimensions. So when this is a still, still image, the renders themselves, you can spin them around, you can have a look in a very, very detailed way. And we're also hoping, hoping to be able to create more, more 3D interpretations as we go. Again, I mentioned that these sites are not publicly accessible because many of them are schools and many of them are prisons and some of them are today private property. So it's not exactly a place where you can go in um, without certain connections or knowing someone or being in a certain position in government ETC. So why it's important for us to remember that these visualizations are also providing access to spaces that are physically inaccessible due to different levels of, of, of barriers. Uh, the visualization you see here is based on President Day evidence and this building is actually standing today and it looks exactly as it does. However, again, it's inaccessible because it is on school property and, and the public cannot access it at will. So the, the digital render is also an, an attempt to create a high level of access, not as good obviously as the physical, visiting the physical site, but sort of interfacing and acting as a go between the two. So in this process of being public historians, amateur historians, learning historians, enthusiastic historians, we're generating a lot of data. We have 3D models, we have photographs, videos, audio recordings, maps, notes, you name it. And um, again, to speak to the impact and the importance of digital tools in strengthening public histories is to look at these digital methodologies, whatever they are, whether they're visualizations, documentations or dissemination, um, as enabling us to reinterpret, to archive, and to create a higher, a different level of abstraction or, or access to material that was not unknown, but just inaccessible. So I was talking about MBC, which is a collective effort, and which is a very active, on the ground, um, community-based uh, approach to working with history. The next thing I'll probably speak about before I go into the challenges and opportunities is individual efforts. And it's not just MBC. We're seeing, um, what we're seeing today is a proliferation of social media sites, blogs, blogs, multiple platforms curating content on African history. For me, as someone who works in this space, but also as someone who enjoys seeing this content, who learns a lot online about, you know, different facets of African history, who had very limited ac access to museum or archives growing up. It wasn't until I was older that I began to frequent these places. I know that these sites are having, these accounts and these sites are having a potential, potential, a massive, sorry, a massive uh, potential impact on audiences and in people learning and, and, and collaborating and, 
using this data in new ways. So on the right now we have uh, on the image there we have History Kenya, which is an online account and curating African um, Kenyan history in particular on social media, Instagram, particularly Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I think with an audience of just of ninety two thousand on Twitter alone, and I think a combined audience of. 200,000 across different platforms. So you can begin to see that these numbers, even by any, any form of, of um, comparison to physical museum visits are staggering in terms of the audience reach. And we need to ask ourselves, what do they say about what audiences want, about what audiences need, about the spaces in which we are primarily, particularly younger audiences accessing historical information. Uh, we have another account on Instagram called Archive Africa with 9,000 followers, which is based in Ghana. And even outside these big accounts, we have smaller, smaller, smaller communities and smaller accounts which are growing. We have Wardro Kenya, which is one of my favorite uh, Instagram accounts, which acts as a repository for Kenyan music. And another account, which is Archivist Unknown, I think also from Ghana, looking at crediting the unknown camera people, photographers and journalists who, whose work constitutes an archive of Ghana. So what we're seeing, whether they have 100 followers or whether they have 90,000 followers, these accounts are people who are using their skills, you know, their time, often, you know, up and unpaid, but also often part-time to speak about an aspect of history that they feel has not either been, been shared or access to materials that are not easily accessible or access to materials that have been particularly either locked away in archives and museums. And what this does in bringing the audience to the audience is creating sort of like a many to many approach in which we're not just looking at institution to audience, we're looking at audience to audience, audience to institution, institution to audience, and just multiple pathways in which historical material is shared, is understood, is curated, is questioned, and is challenged. So to speak mainly to the challenges of this work today, I think there's a lack of financial and infrastructural support because it's not, it's, it's still considered quite very, um, like, you know, a hobby. Um, therefore, there's, there's very little financial support, despite the immense impact that these accounts and these approaches are having in, in reaching new audiences, in bringing in new audiences, and into broadening and strengthening the understanding of histories that were unknown, suppressed, or marginalized. There's still no infrastructural support or even in, in financial support for this work. Um, the other challenge is there's a lot of delegitimizing of African participation. I'm speaking mainly to my contest within historical documentation. And uh, other than MDC, I've also done a number of projects, um, another project where I was looking at the history of railways in Kenya. And I went around the country taking photographs of railway station. But what was interesting to me was that people never believed that it was for historical purposes. Whereas perhaps if I was a, as a white man or someone you know, from the academy, people would believe that this was the work that I was doing. But it was always like, why are you doing this work? History is not enough. You have to have an ulterior motive. And it's mainly, I think it's not, it's not even a question of, of, of malice or intent. It's just that participation is not something that we are used to seeing or we are used to, to encountering. Therefore, when we see people doing it, not only does it feel foreign, um, there is a level of, of, of um, suspiciousness perhaps uh, attached to it. And I think strengthening and enabling people to work within this space, normalizing participation, whether it's from the museum, for example, the National Museums of Kenya, how do they encourage people who want to document their history? Are there structures that are in place for people who want to deposit um, information within the archives and the, and, the, and the museum sector? Because we know that they're struggling. We know that our museums, our archives are an immense pressure um, to work with very limited financial resources. And I think it now, what we need to start asking ourselves is how can how can we strengthen these these opportunities look at these audiences that are, are online and and strengthen the work that the museum is doing but also vice versa and lastly that there, there are very few if at all systems to deposit work with public or academic institutions 
which raises the questions of um, if this material is, is, if Twitter goes down today and if YouTube, YouTube goes down today, what happens to that material? You know, um, are there ways in which we could create digital data repositories um, are there ways in which we could we could assess the quality of data and then this can be deposited into into archives academic institutions and libraries. So these are questions when uh, when we look at strengthening I think it'd be really key and, and really important to ask. Yes, people can use digital tools. Yes, we have a lot of um, public history initiatives going on, but at the end of the day, how do we contribute this to, to a broader scale, you know, in terms of preservation of this data? Um, because in as much as everyone is, is doing this, we still are in need of specialist advice, specialist skills, practitioner skills, whether it's practitioners who, who have academic backgrounds or who have been in the sector for a very long time, who know what's the best way to preserve this data? Can we have public history workshops? Um, can we create public history toolkits? And these are some of the things that um, I think my work seeks to answer, but also I hope to see in the near future uh, in terms of how institutions or universities and, and um, community organizations relate, you know, um, asking ourselves, how do we strengthen and encourage this culture of public participation in a, in a sector that was previously man, man, marginalized but dominated by Eurocentric paradigms of historical preservation? You know, so for cultures that were based on oral history, you know, oral history as the main form of, of historical preservation, how do we strengthen that as opposed to just relying solely on, you know, archives and museums? which are largely foreign concepts around history and preservation that have been brought here and that we are still adjusting to in many ways. Um, how do we measure the impact of these digital collections and interactions? So for me, this is a question outside looking at quantitative data, you know, analytics, but also the qualitative impact of this work. How do we know that, you know, this work is meaningful? Is it the comments that people write? Is it someone going out and doing this based on what they've already seen? Is it someone attending a workshop? So having um, ways of measuring and understanding the impact and how can museums and cultural institutions become spaces that facilitate these discussions instead of um, spaces that um, are seen as alternatives, you know, as mutually exclusive. I think to, to end my, my presentation, I'll, I'll speak to this quote by Michelle Mogo, who is a Kenyan poet and writer and, and playwright. Um, but one day we shall explore the negative silences and paralyzing terror imposed on us by the tyranny of dominating cultures and the languages of context. We shall discover authentic voices of our self-naming and renaming, reclaiming our roles as composers, speaking for ourselves because we too have tongues, you know. And for me, this is beautiful because I look at the space that digital tools, the digital media have created as strengthening our tongues, as us speaking ourselves to ourselves, for ourselves in our own tongues, but also be able to reach those who want to hear and those who want to listen without any um, particular gatekeeping or interventions. So I started this talk is saying, you know, we'll speak about the future of history. And for me, I think the future of history is in many ways decentralized. Uh, it's multifaceted. It has room for multiple voices and it's something that is constantly evolving. And I hope that this can be something that we continue to strengthen either as, as practitioners, as people who are studying within the digital humanities and as academic institutions. Thank you very much.